uh, of the talk is Does an AI Evangelist Drive a Yellow Submarine? And this is indeed a pretty weird title, you might think. Um, and we will come to this like in a few minutes why I chose exactly this title. I'm Julia herzog Witter. And I have uh, learned quite a lot in my position as AI evangelist at Scout24, what I want to share with you today. And I also want to share with you what I learned from other companies, what worked or what didn't work so well. So you can expect, expect that I share with you actions I would recommend you to take if you run like a change program similar to the one I ran as AI evangelist. And also uh, some recommendation on what actions would I change or maybe even drop um, if I were in the same position today, again, with the experiences and learnings I have today. So first about me, uh, I'm Julia. And before coming into the position as AI evangelist at Scout, um, I did a few other things uh, which were still close to it. So I worked in innovation consulting in a company called Systematic Inventive Thinking. So a very structured and systematic approach. And we also ran programs which are called innovation-driven change. So you might already think like, ah, innovation-driven change is a bit different to normal change management. And this most obviously helped me also a lot in my position as AI evangelist. I got to know design thinking within this uh, position as well. And some of you might also be familiar with this method of approaching user needs and building products uh, people really need. And I guess this combined uh, knowledge and experiences helped me to also have kind of a steep career in product management. I first uh, started at Expert here in product management as normal product manager. And then I joined Scout24 uh, first as product manager and then as team lead and head of product in the OEM segment, which was one company unit um, at Scout24. And with this combined knowledge, uh, I still decided to go in a very different track, a very unique track at that time. And I became AI evangelist at Scout in late 2018, beginning of 2019. And maybe some of you here in the audience, I can't see everybody because quite a lot of people there already have also been at the CDTM, so the Center of Digital Technology and Management here in Munich, which most probably also uh, put the, me into the path of digitalization. That's a few words about me. And when I went onto the mission as AI evangelist, um, I had actually one goal. It was about educating people and making them ready to, to build AI products, but not really more. So this was what I had to do. And it was a bit tabula rasa, or I really had to, had a lot of creativity space, but which I wanted to most obviously fill with structure and uh, really, yeah, systematic approach towards it. So I'm sharing with you here in these four little uh, segments, I'm sharing with you a super simple change framework, which still helps a lot if you wanna launch a similar program um, because it really makes you think about all the things which are necessary um, to have in mind from an employee's perspective as well. So what are these factors you have to take into consideration? It's inspiration its skills, its structures, and its processes. So this is translated into the employee's thoughts. And I can when it, uh, I, <laughs> I want when it comes to inspiration. So inspiration means really people want to do something afterwards because they are inspired to do so. It's about skills. So this is translated into the employee's language, I can. So I have the skills in order to do so. It's structures, which is also a little bit I, I must because the structure is like this. And the process is most obviously is also like I can do it also from a process perspective. So it's working out. So when I started with our mission to make Scout uh, AI ready, um, I looked onto this simple framework and I thought, okay, so what do we have to do? And I want to share you, with you chronologically also the, the actions I took uh, together with my team there and also share, of course, a bit what went well in the beginning and what not so that we afterwards really come to the super strong learnings where I hope that you also can take some home um, in if you're running a similar program or yeah, also if you have somebody around who has to do something similar. So again, here the framework, the inspiration, skills, structures, and the processes, and behind yeah, the, yellow, the yellow submarine, because this is, of course, where we want to also have the connection afterwards too. 
what we started uh, late 2018, where we ran the so-called AI use case discovery workshops. This was uh, supposed, and it also, also was, a big bang where everybody in the company was informed what was going on. So also every single employee could uh, participate in these workshops, could just send an email back and say like, hey, I find this is super interesting, which made also a really interesting mixed crowd come together in these workshops. So we ran uh, around seven workshops, which roughly 10% of all employees at Scout at that point. And um, people got a little... Yeah, knowledge and learning and inspiration session in the beginning. And then we let people pretty free come up with ideas what we could in, do in the company itself um, in order to build really good AI products. So yeah, also making sure that all, everybody could give the ideas into the room. And this was a really, really interesting big bang. And we heard also in the feedback that this kind of inspiration and little knowledge pieces were super good for people. So we had a little bit of time left um, at the end of, uh, of that year. And we said, okay, let's do something which is pretty different. And you see the little Santa Claus here in the inspiration corner. Um, so what we did, we, we created an advent calendar, which is pretty typical here in Germany. And we, we said there are little nudges of knowledge um, which help people to get some inspiration, but also yeah, some insights. Uh, what does machine learning mean? What could they could they do um, in a, in their um, different product teams? Possibly because there were some ideas also from other companies, and it's a very big mixture. And I'm sharing with you um, in a minute also a link to my Medium uh, profile where I wrote also the exact content of this advent calendar. So if you are planning on doing something else, uh, something similar, then you could uh, use this maybe as a little inspiration. So we did that, and this was our wrap up of the year. And then in the next step, um, we um, wanted to foster also um, yeah, a sense of community. So we had seen at that point that there, there was quite a lot of things already ongoing, and people had quite some knowledge gathered already. And we wanted to make sure to use all that uh, to yeah, create a really, really ideal uh, learning journey for every single employee in order to make also the really the whole company AI ready and educate everybody. And we call this program the AI Ambassadors. Um, so you already have the word ambassadors with it. So we really wanted to make sure from each company unit that people were coming to this program and sharing what they knew already, but also sharing what they wanted to learn next. And an ambassador is like basically in two, <laughs> yeah, in two countries, so the country where he or she is the ambassador, but she's working also for the country where somebody is coming from. And this is, was our idea behind that we really had a knowledge sharing platform there. And this was first a pretty exclusive community as we also wanted this. So we didn't have an application, even though we thought about this in the beginning, but uh, it was still that we wanted to name three people from each business unit. So a product person, a tech person, and a data scientist to come together in this, in this uh, room of community. And this started off pretty well and people were sharing a lot of, uh, yeah, they're learning once, but also about what they knew already. And it was pretty fruitful in the beginning. And we created so-called topic of the month um, according to the priorities people had in regards to learning. Um, but uh, it went a bit more to the point after like three or four sessions that people started to send a substitute and then uh, suddenly people dropped out because and that's something I'm going to share also in my learnings in the end there were also a pretty pretty a lot of other priorities at that point uh, in in the company as you might also know it from your company and that's something where it went from super exclusive to more loose and we opened at that point also up to have uh, learn sessions in a in a framework uh, which was called Lunch and Learn. So we brought people together at a place in the company where a lot of people could really learn um, at a point uh, in time where there was no other things ongoing during the daily schedule. So for example, we had some sessions in our cafeteria where uh, people were sitting anyways and they were suddenly like, wow, that's super interesting. I can listen to this talk. And we invited external speakers for this, but we also shared internal success stories in these sessions. So we went from this, as I said before, 
very, very small community to broaden this up. And why did we do this at all? So you could say like, hey, you have an AI evangelist. That's pretty amazing. Few companies have. Um, we still said um, as a company over a thousand employees, it's pretty hard that one person is really changing how things are going. So we wanted to have a multiplication effect by having these ambassadors who were basically those multiplicators of the program. So that's where we went. And as I said before, we, we created so-called topic of the month where we wanted to really catch what was most important for people at that time um, as topics which we discussed, which we learned about, where we prepared uh, like crispy knowledge sessions, um, or we also shared uh, internal, external success stories. And we wanted to really make sure that the whole month was filled with this topic. So not only lunch and learn sessions or AI ambassador sessions, but also um, like those nudges of knowledge people could uh, read on their desk um, yeah, whenever they have the time. We also wanted to make sure that nobody um, nor um, product teams or data scientists also could be in an ivory tower. So we wanted to really bring people in the structure um, together. So we made sure that the data scientists were within product teams and were working close to product teams. And um, when you see this color coded, that's green, um, that's a structural part. And here we come to this huge blue uh, skills part. What we did parallel to all of that was we wanted to design a really, really good learning journey for all functions. So not too much, not too little, not the stuff people already knew and not the stuff which was not so relevant, but really the right learning content. And what I additionally learned, that's what I promised as well, like things which work with other companies. Um, I learned a lot about this on conferences where, where I went, where my team went, etc. So one thing I learned, and I will come to this also in this wrap up, like what do I definitely suggest you to do if you want to run a similar program or you see something like that happening in your company, you might really have um, a supportive goal setting. So every employee having one part of their goals are connected to this program you're running. Then a really good learning opportunity, which is also inspiring and making this I want of employees very strong um, are company exchanges where you have a certain topic, for example, and you come together with different uh, company uh, companies or different teams from other companies, uh, which are most probably, of course, not the direct competition, but from a similar area, maybe, um, where you can also exchange about, yeah, how are you do, do, uh, doing the things or how are you, um, yeah, getting ideas, et cetera, or et cetera. Yeah, that's basically it. And the next part is within com your company yourself. You might want to do competitions or hack days or hackathons, or you might even have done this already. And then there's, of, it, of course, also internally external conference, conferences, which are a very inspiring factor um, and what I saw work well in other companies. Or, of course, very creative learning journeys, which take a while to be set up, but then are really cool for the whole company. For example, in a gaming format, that's a format that's something I saw as well happening, that people had this really creative with one room. And um, yeah, but that's something which took, of course, a lot of time for them to also set up and what you probably can't do just besides your normal job. So as I promised, you can read a little bit more about all the stuff or almost all the stuff I talked about right now on Medium. I'm sharing later also in the chat um, all those links. Again, if you don't have the chance to now scan the QR code or put it in your browser. And so you will have the possibility to read this. And now coming to the big question, uh, what does all of this have to do with the yellow submarine? Um, and does an AI evangelist drive a yellow submarine at all? So Yellow Submarine, um, some of you might not know um, the video or the lyrics of this song of the Beatles. So I'm shortly sh sharing with you like the, the story of the video and the, the lyrics which popped up into my mind where I was like, ah, that's a similar job. I think. So what you see in the video at the very beginning is like a captain um, which is guiding a crew of, or a group of people, the Beatles in this case, of course, to a vessel, so the Yellow Submarine. And the lyrics, um, sorry, 
um, the lyrics go um, here. In the sound, a town where I was born lived a man who sailed to sea and he told us of his life in the land of submarines. So we sailed onto the sun till we found a sea of green and we lived beneath the waves in our yellow submarine. And the engines turn and the journey begins. And there are many, many colorful fish which are looking interesting. And the whole sea life looks very interesting in this video. And then you suddenly also see a creature like this, which seems out of this earth. And you're wondering, like, how can this creature swim at all? So something which seems impossible first, but then when you look carefully, uh, it's working, obviously. And you see also the crew making sure that the whole submarine is driving carefully, uh, properly. And at some point in the video, you see another yellow submarine crossing the way of the first yellow submarine. And the crew comes to the window and waves to the other crew in the other submarine. And that's where the lyrics go. And our friends are all aboard. And many more live, of them live next door. And the band begins to play. And then you have some sound of the band. And then a new theme begins, uh, a theme of the time clocking um, and uh, clocks ticking. And that's where you see, first of all, running the times through different years. You see that the crew is growing like lots of long white beard and hair. And you see even a time bomb. And I will share with you why I think this is something which is also important to keep in mind when you want to drive an AVI evangelism program. And then it's getting a bit chaotic because then uh, one of the crew members uh, is catapulted out of a submarine and almost eaten by a dinosaur-like um, creature. But a horse-like creature comes across and saves this man. And then the submarine has to fight against a violet monster. And the first violet monster makes uh, a big kick and the submarine spins. But the second uh, violet monster, the submarine knows what to do and can defend itself. And there are quite interesting defend, defense and uh, general functions of this submarine. So this looks a lot like Carnival in Rio here. And this really looks like the Santa Claus uh, I shared with you in the beginning and an ironing here. So pretty weird. Um, and in this pretty uh, chaotic uh, phase of um, the video, the lyrics are not chaotic all, at all, because they say, as we live a life of ease, every one of us has all we need, sky of blue and sea of green, and our yellow submarine. And you might be smiling now, uh, reading about the life of ease, and every one of us has all we need. Is this ever the case if you start something new and if you are looking onto data? So most probably there are always people uh, who don't have all they need. And that's something which really made a ring in my heart when I heard the lyrics last time. And then this whole song and video ends with uh, the yellow submarine suddenly flying in the sky uh, below a rainbow and the crew being all super cheerful on top of the board. And there's an interpretation of this song saying the yellow submarine is actually a vessel which brings us all to safety where good wins over evil. And there we come to what does it have to do with an AI evangelist. So most probably if your company is running a similar program as we did, um, it's not only because it's a really cool technology and there are amazing possibilities. It's most probably also because your company is really aware that without using this vessel, so without using this technology, it's not so safe out there because there is just better products possible for users which are more happy. So that's actually this interpretation of the song is right. I guess where my wish, mission was as AI evangelist to make sure we were able to um, yeah, build good AI products in order to make sure to really bring our company to, to the future. And uh, that's the first thing where it really comes together. And to have very clear mission is, I think, very, very important. And the captain of the Yellow Submarine does have that. Um, one thing I learned, so you see here, it's the learned and the keep um, yeah, columns, what I promised you in the beginning. Um, one thing I learned is it's super important to have clear numbers because you will be measured on your numbers. And uh, if nobody tells you like, or, or if you do not define, that's my goal to reach, it's hard to measure. And most probably that's super clear for everybody in this, this group of people anyways, because you work in data, but make sure if you run a similar program to have this. And a side note, 
I said in the beginning, my clear goal was to educate people and to make them ready to build good uh, AI products. But you could, of course, also question, is this the most important goal? Or it might be the mission more to have X percent of revenue through AI products or to have X AI products uh, successfully used by users in the next one, two, three years. Or is it something like, uh, I don't know, um, educating people, inspiring people, or well, what is it exactly? So make sure that you yourself uh, define your mission very clearly also in numbers in order to also be able to measure yourself across it. Then that's what I mentioned very shortly. Um, make it a top priority in your company or make sure that this whole program is a top priority because you otherwise might run into problems like you need people to support you with something, but they are like, mm, I have something more important to do. I know that's a hard one. And uh, it's most probably also something where you have to search a lot of uh, yeah, discussions with your C-level, but you might really need the support in order to make sure that you can do your job as best as possible. Um, ideally, that's the learning I heard from other companies, have it even in people's goals so that everybody has a certain target in regards to this program, uh, which he or he has to reach in order to reach the, the personal goals as well. Then a fair learning I had, and um, we had good reasons to start with um, our AI ambassador program before launching a big learning program. But what I really learned is that it might be better to have a learning program, which is not perfect and ideal, but which is broad for everybody. Uh, before starting into this community phase, because it both needs a lot of time, right? And uh, yeah, ha having the perfect learning journey might not be possible, but rather go balls and make sure that everybody is really in the picture and knowing what everybody else knows. And then the discussions might be also more fruitful in the community, because what we encountered was also that the knowledge levels were so different, um, that yeah, when some people were discussing a topic, uh, others were like, oh my God, is this magic or is this something uh, I should know? And this also yeah, made the, the exchange at some points not as fruitful as it might have been. So I think community is super important, but uh, try to be quick with a big learning program and yeah, maybe choose a done over perfect uh, because that's it's so important. So that's, I think, also the three most important success factors I, I'm seeing when I'm doing this little retrospective with myself on, on my job I did there. There are, of course, things I would keep as well, and I want to share these with, those, uh, with you as well. So I guess what was good, I told you about the advent calendar we also had for the AI ambassadors uh, sunglasses in order to make sure people were recognizing them and able to talk to them. So that's different and unique formats. And... I think um, that's a very important thing to have those in a way that they are short and easy to digest for everybody. Um, first of all, that's cool because people are really seeing you because you're really different than the normal um, newsletter coming from, I don't know, accounting, for example. And second, it's also when something is top of mind because it's so interesting, people will also invest a little bit more, more time and look into what you have to say more carefully. Um, in this context, I have to say, we, as I said before, we had this AI inspiration going out every month. Um, also learning on that, we sent this uh, over email because we tested around uh, with, um, with different tools and that had the best numbers at that time. But what we never tried out was to have like, uh, like uh, your phone number of the people, for example, and send like a message there, which only works if people really are using company phones because otherwise you might not have all the numbers but really go different ways in order to um yeah get people whenever they have like a few minutes and they are like oh wow that's really interesting oh sorry for that then um share internal success stories that's always good because people suddenly realize wow we can actually do this and that makes this i want in employees even stronger yeah, that's the rub people in the face. It doesn't sound too nice, but sometimes it's really important, uh, especially at the beginning of the journey, which is adventurous, and that most probably is an AI readiness journey. 
Um, so wrap them in the face what is possible at other companies which are not called Google or Amazon. And that's between, if you think about this, uh, this creature which was swimming like a human in the sea below the yellow submarine, this is a bit what I'm thinking of. Like there are sometimes stories which you really have to share with other, others in order to make sure that they lose this fear of like, wow, well, we can't do it because you see other companies can do it, so you might also be able to do it. Yeah, the lunch and learn sessions were pretty cool also with uh, external and internal speakers because they made it even possible for people who didn't have the time of reading messages or who were a bit further away because they weren't part of the AI ambassadors to suddenly come into the topic and realize that this was relevant for them. And I said learning of a community. I really think I would do this this way uh, today, but still make sure there is um, exchange and still make sure that there is kind of community growing, because I think this is, yeah, as you saw it on the crew uh, of the Yellow Submarine at the very end, this is what makes this all have a totally different drive than only have it as a top priority of your company. Yeah, this makes it passion, this makes it, yeah, it's a top priority, you have to do it. And last but not least, I guess I'm a super hands-on person and um, I'm learning quickly and that's a big advantage. And I have a lot of uh, knowledge in product management and innovation and change management as well. But I'm not a data guru. I might be like, if you look into insights, profiles, uh, mine says I'm an inspiring motivator. So I'm most probably a really good person for being an evangelist, but I'm still not a data person. And Looking onto my job right now, from today's perspective, it might have been a good idea to have a tandem with a person who has the, all this data and AI credibility, combined with a person who has all the knowledge about marketing, internal communication, change management. I know that's most probably if you go to um, your C level and say, we want to have two people running an evangelism program, it might be even harder. But nevertheless, this might be also something cool to work together. So I had the pleasure of having a really great data science team without, within Scout um, where people helped me and had really good ideas as well. I don't know if everybody has this, this great uh, community by itself already, but having a tandem would definitely help in some ways um, a lot on that. So this is a bit my, my journey rethought. Um, I will share this slide with you or Afi will and share the slide with you anyways um, when, when the YouTube video is out. Um, yeah, you see it's a bit different, uh, yeah, order, sorry, um, order of the, the different actions I took from the learnings I did basically had in my own retrospective. And I said, I'm not a data person. So you might be wondering why I also started uh, in the beginning with saying like I support people to take good decisions. And I would even say I support people to take, take good decisions uh, data drivenly. And you might know the situation where you have a pro and cons list on a decision in your company or personally, um, and you really, really don't find a perfect solution. So that's actually what I have done within the last uh, years um, to also come up with the decision method, which is data driven and which is better than a pro and cons list. And that's what I'm doing actually today. So I help people um, with taking good decisions and filling them with life. Um, and that's something I do because I, I've gathered so much knowledge also as AI evangelist that you need a certain amount of reflection and you need a uh, data journalist with coaching together at some points in order to get over the bumps as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where, where I changed a little bit my, my way currently and where I'm working um, yeah, officially as business coach. Um, and um, yeah, that's one of the parts I'm helping people with, with decisions, but of course also with other bumps where it's like about saying no to another project coming in and uh, people expecting me to do even more projects or whatever. So that's uh, where I shifted to. And um, if you want to learn more, I see that I'm running out of time, but if you want to know more about the evangelism uh, program I ran or also about uh, taking good decisions, uh, don't hesitate to contact me or to connect with me over LinkedIn. Um, yeah, and feel free to ask any questions there. We have a second talk upcoming. I think we have a very short time for Q&A. Um, yeah, so whatever question is top of mind, uh, feel free to ask immediately. 
And if we don't have the time today, reach out to me. Um, thank you very much, Afi, for being here today and uh, looking forward to your questions now. Thank you so much, Julia. This was so inspiring. And the story that you shared brought all the pieces together. Um, as we are running out of time, I would like to invite everybody to use chat for sharing questions or the Miro board. On the Miro board, share your, your LinkedIn profile that we can get back to you. If you have questions, add it there so that in a joint last Q&A, then we can address it hopefully. Now I would love to give the stage to Paul and Florian for sharing us about the activities of Tume AI and how in really impressive way you connect to students to even more industrial initiatives. All right, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Paul will be screen sharing for us today. Uh, we're both oh, members yeah. of Tume AI and we'll talk about connecting students and companies for AI projects. My name is Florian. I'm a third semester uh, computer science informatics student at UM with a focus on machine learning. And I'm a team lead for educational department at TUMAI. Paul, feel free to also speak some sentences about your background. Yeah. Um, which screen am I currently sharing? Is it the right yeah, one? Yeah, perfect. Or... Right one. Okay. Perfect. Because it doesn't show the green border. Yeah, sure. So. I'm um, Paul. I'm also studying at TUM. I'm studying electrical engineering in my master's. But in electrical engineering, there's also a lot of things <laughs> concerning software and AI. So that's how I got interested in the topic. And yeah, this year I joined some AI in the industry department. And yeah, excited to have a good presentation. All right. We'll talk about the student initiative to AI, of which we are members. And we'll present how students and companies can work together to find innovative AI solutions. You will find out how to apply AI in the industry and how students can get involved in this growing field. First of all, I'll give you an introduction to our student initiative. I am part of the student initiative to AI since I really like its vision and goals. Our vision is to include everyone in a bright future with AI. And we, as a student initiative, are open to all students um, sharing our vision and values, no matter what the main knowledge they may have, social background, gender, we're open for all people sharing our values. And our mission is to enable and connect students with the relevant stakeholders to facilitate the application of AI across different domains and drive positive societal impact through these interdisciplinary projects. At uh, Tomi AI, we want to shape the decision makers of tomorrow as we think that the people knowledgeable about AI can become exactly that. We want to push the applications of AI across domains since it has the potential to be beneficial in basically every domain. There's more than just your personal voice assistant. Um, a voice assistant is just one application, but we think that everybody should be able to have the chance to benefit from AI. We want to make positive impact with the solutions we develop. And furthermore, we at Tumi AI thrive to become a renowned player in the international AI ecosystem. And last but not least, every individual project we tackle should thrive and be a success. I'll also present you some numbers about what we do so you get a better picture of our student initiative. With more than 125 total active members, Tumi AI is the largest AI student initiative in Germany. Our members have more than 30 different nationalities and more than 15 different majors, so we're quite a diverse team. The core of our student initiative is its management team, which consists of the team leads of the nine departments, as well as the mentors and free presidents. I personally am a team lead for the educational department. Tome AI has been growing very quickly since its founding in 2020. We've developed more than 20 international AI, uh, internal AI products and uh, came up with four signature events. These are the four signature events, uh, which are our main offerings. I'm a teammate for the educational department and we're currently preparing a first iteration of the AI school, which will be a lecture series in cooperation with Trump professors and industry experts. And we've also had the first AI bootcamp at the beginning of this semester, which is uh, especially beneficial for non-computer science students so that everyone has an understanding of AI and can start their AI journey. The Mechaton department has already organized three Mechatons with more than 110 teams, 15 of which ended up creating a startup from their idea. 
The focus of this talk will be the AI industry projects by the industry department, of which Paul is a member. Furthermore, the venture department is creating the AI lab, which is an AI venture builder for students, where they will drive around a problem and adapt their solutions over the course of the program through build, measure, and learn cycles. And we're connecting talents across domains who are interested in solving societal problems with AI. Since the goal of our student initiative is also to develop AI solutions that benefit everyone, I'd like to talk um, some more minutes um, also about a project we did with the KNUST University, which is a university located in Ghana. Obeng, who at that time was an exchange student at UM, reached out asking whether Tumayai can organize a workshop for his home university in Ghana. Within just three weeks, a team from Tumayai and KNUST discussed and set up a three-day remote workshop, introducing AI to a wide audience in Ghana and followed by a hands-on project phase. There was an introduction to machine learning algorithms, how to come up with and evaluate AI use cases. And Patrick also showcased how AI ideas could be realized with little technical knowledge using, for example, Google's AI platform. The interest was incredible. We had more than 400 applications from Ken UST University students across all different domains. To make the event a success, we have more than 20 helpers and supporters. And the students were able to identify more than 10 different practical AI use cases in their life. We had four expert members uh, during a final pitch day as a jury. And the whole event was accompanied by three lectures on AI, by Tom AI and Google. And this whole thing had one goal. The students should learn about and create AI use cases for tackling their real world problem. As you can see, sometimes small inquiries can grow up to have a large impact. With a group of motivated students, projects and ideas can move quickly. The key takeaway is it does not have to be perfect to have an effect. The lectures were definitely not perfect and neither were the workshops, but now we have a good foundation to iterate on and help can use these students tackle their real problems. We're now developing further projects with their university. We're planning to have regular AI boot camps. The next one will likely happen in August. Furthermore, we want to have joint teams of KNUST and TUM students for the next Makeathon happening in October. And as a long-term goal, we also want to have on-site exchanges to work on real-world problems, as well in Ghana, as well as in uh, Munich. On the right, you can see a picture of the recent visit of Professor Campagno from KNUST University, who visited our student initiative in Munich. We had a great meeting and are in, working now on growing our collaboration. We think that the collaboration with KNUST is very important since we want to broaden our horizon and we can learn from each other. It's not a one-sided collaboration. Also, we want to identify global robot problems solvable with AI. A lot of the problems German students might not even be aware of. And last but not least, we want to deploy working solutions together. It's not only educational, but also hands-on. TUMAI stands for inclusive, accessible, and democratized use of AI. As mentioned earlier, we want to enable talented students to apply their knowledge in industry settings. Okay, so now that Florian has given an introduction to the general topic of TUMAI and how we drive social impact, I want to take a bit about another key part of our mission, which is to broaden the AI community and connect students to industry partners. And this is the industry project facilitated by the industry department, which I'm a member of. And yeah, our main, main topic is we try to um, connect students with the industry through the so-called industry phase. The industry phase is a project which runs for about 10 weeks where we source a bunch of students, so 30 to 40 students from a technical background but various technical backgrounds, not only computer science, uh, to work on projects at co partner companies and teams of four to five students for roughly 10 weeks, where we really try to build a solution for a specific problem the partner company poses to us. So we, together with them, come up with a challenge that should be solved with an AI framework, but could be from any domain. And we want to really create some real business value for them and also some learnings for the students. And yeah, in the project, the students use some cutting edge AI frameworks and also can work on any part of the AI infrastructure. So 
whether it's from data processing to model building to model testing to implementing an entire pipeline. We had all those kinds of projects. And so far, we're pretty proud that we have already done two successful industry phases in which we had seven projects which we implemented with students and companies. And I want to give a quick overview of how we do those industry phases. And yeah, then we also talk about some learnings we had and some projects we had so far. Okay, so what is our process? So basically there are three steps to, to organizing these projects. First, of course, we're a student initiative. We, we are not directly have any industry internally. So we connect to partner companies by reaching out to them. Um, whether it's a company, we also reach out to organizations like nonprofits or a research institutes. And we try to connect with them on really some common goals and find people or companies that are really passionate about working together with students, but also uh, industries, uh, different fields where we can really have an impact. So we feel that we can actually provide some value to them. And then we go out and pitch our ideas uh, to the interested companies and try to um, come to grips with how we can work together with them and build some cool projects. and. Once we've confirmed some, some companies, some interested companies or organizations, we go over into actually planning a project, which for us is really a collaborative project. So we try to collaborate with the company to see uh, what they need, what are some problems they're working on, whether they're relatively new to AI or they're like a company that's really a lot working a lot with this topic, but maybe wants to explore a different subject, which they they don't have time yet or the resources to really do it with a dedicated team. And therefore we try to explore them first, what, what they can expect actually from projects they do with us. So what we can provide and also uh, what kinds of constraints we have. So if there's really a project, for example, a company that hasn't done so much with AI before, if it's very realistic, if there's enough data available so that we can actually have maximum impact in this short time period. And then we actually go out after we have defined projects and source students from our network, which is one of our key contributions that we have an active network of students at Tome AI, which are from various disciplines, all focusing or interested in the topic of AI, applying it in medicine and engineering, in environmental studies in all different fields. And we also reach out to other students from the university to find people who want to participate. And we also reach out to experts to guide the students through this industry phase. So through this project to really have success. And then it goes into implementation and the students actually work on the project for about 10 weeks. And in the end also present the work and the colloquium so that we actually can um, yeah, see the key results they had and if they really achieved what we set out to do and also hand the results over to the company, which it can hopefully then use as an actual building block for some project they're working on. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to take a closer look uh, quickly at how we form effective partnerships with companies. So about reaching out to companies, as I said, we basically, I mean, in the beginning, it's really reaching out to companies, writing some emails, but also uh, taking contacts from inside to my eye, people who work at different places, um, or also our expanding network of companies, which we have worked previously with. And we really try to be broad. So not only think of companies who are specifically in more of a software domain or very specific to AI, but really also companies from other industries. For example, I think last uh, industry phase, we had a company who's connecting CFRS with shipping companies through like an online exchange platform. Like there's different projects which we hope we can have an impact on. And once we've actually some companies we are interested in working with and that are interested in working with us, which is more important, I think, um, we try to, as I said, align on some common goals that we can provide some value to them, but it also provides value to the students who actually do the project because they're committing their time and they not only want to work on something, but they really want to learn something. So we try to really find a project that's valuable also to them. And also we try to focus on the strengths we provide. So um, the key thing we think that's our strength or that's, that we can provide is basically this broad community 
we have a lot of different motivated students and we can really access broad pool of applicants. Um, but for that, or for our projects, we then also want to focus on uh, topics that are actually impact driven, which work on the key goals we have that Florian presented at the beginning, really driving some social impact also through our projects where we really see, for example, we had a lot of projects in the healthcare community or about um, making supply systems more efficient and those things. And we also like to find companies that are really motivated in working with us because that results in the best partnerships when you really uh, have an active exchange between the students and the expert from a company or the company in general, which maybe they even go on and working at that company or so on. But that's when the real nice projects happen. And in the end, of course, we also have to deliver on our promises. So of course we can promise a pie in the sky, but we also have to deliver something. So uh, we try to give the students guidance throughout the project with expert lectures to actually help them succeed in a specific topic and also have the company provide an expert who can guide them a bit. And we are also getting more selective with the people we actually choose for our project uh, so that we know that the participants are have the required skills to succeed in that. You'll be right back. <laughs> Until we are having Paul back, is there any question, everyone? Yeah, feel free to just write questions in the chat and I can go over them. At the end of the talk, Paul will also talk about how you can get involved. So if you have any questions about that, Paul will probably answer your questions. Uh, towards the end. Let's give them some seconds. Yes, Paul is back. Oh, sorry, did my internet just connect? I... Yeah, just share uh, your screen again and we'll continue. Okay, <laughs> where did we stop? <laughs> sorry. End of the slide. Of okay, forming okay. effective partnerships. That's good. Then you can continue. One second. Um, let's see. Okay. You see my Perfect. screen? Yeah. We've already implemented um, and helped many companies conceptualize, implement, and evaluate their first AI projects. And here's a list of some of our past projects. And today we'll focus on the two projects marked in purple. The first um, project I'll talk about was in cooperation with Heim Capital and was about real estate price modeling. The real estate business is currently transforming itself. Before online real estate platforms were built, things like ImmoScout, ImmoBot, and others, real estate agents were the only ones in the market with the knowledge of available listings. But this has changed. Today, many real estate owners can directly advertise online. This means that a fair price for the property needs to be decided on without a real estate agent. But nowadays we have a price data from neighboring estates and we have a structured data about things the owners provide as well. So the students of TomAI developed an AI solution that combines two data sources. It has a web scraper that is used to extract information from listings online. And then this data is enriched with very valuable information from Heim Capital. We have a geospatial database for different districts. And with this data, our student team has built an AI-driven evaluation system that can predict real estate prices based on these features of the property itself, as well as the statistical geospatial data. And this system can then estimate fair prices and create instant appraisals. The second project I would like to talk about was with Precise.ai about clothing size prediction. According to a McKinsey study in 2018, the fashion industry is responsible for 4% of the total carbon emissions worldwide. And 4%, in my opinion, is quite a lot. And one major problem here is uh, frequent cloth returns due to wrong fit and sizes. Every single prevented return corresponds to half a kilogram of saved CO2 carbon emissions. So our students set out to develop a deep learning-based recommendation system that predicts the correct size based on a few questions about body composition. 
They combine the customer questionnaire to get the data about the customer's body measurements and composition with retailer's database on reasons why customers returned their orders. And with this data, the size prediction model can recommend sizes for new purchases to the customer. This reduces the number of returns for improper sizes. And therefore, it also reduces the CO2 carbon emissions. So this project really showcases how Tum AI uses AI for good. Okay, so now that we've talked a lot about the industry phase, uh, I just and also saw some projects. I uh, want to go over some key learnings we had so far from the last two industry phases we implemented. And mainly, I split it up into project side and organization side. So what we found out over the time is that it really is important to, in the beginning, um, like make a check with the company. I call it the AI maturity assessment, basically looking at if the, the thing we want to implement is actually feasible and if it is something we as Tomei can provide with people who source uh, to actually go into the project and know that it's something we can realize and we don't over under promise and that the company is actually yeah ready for it and not just going into AI because they think it's an exciting topic, um, but we can actually have some impact there. And yeah, as I already said, we really met, found out that it's, good to have a broad scope of companies we we ask or we um, contact uh, because we found out that there's really a lot of domains in which we can have impact and that's also kind of our statement as we said in the beginning we really want to work in different fields and apply AI to them because it's like two you can apply to so many different problems and also sounds a bit cliche but thinking big definitely helps uh, when setting out to do something because in the end when you have like a really expiring goal everyone works harder to to work on it like the projects we said before where you really build an entire AI pipeline in just 10 weeks with students you don't even know before maybe and on the organization side these are also some things that were important we found out so in our first industry phase we didn't have any compensation and we thought that it is somewhat hard to get like the maybe the the best students for certain things because they can also work on other things and uh, also to keep them motivated throughout the, the project that they actually feel evaluated so we started to offer competitive salary to the students uh, to extract uh, attract more more students and also to keep them motivated a bit more and on the other side we also implemented this system of support with lectures throughout the entire industry phase where students learn about a specific area of AI which they are currently working on and also getting some input on the specific field in which they are applying it. And in the end we always try to iterate and learn so we uh, ask the companies and also the students after industry projects or throughout how it's going for them, how it was for them, what was good, what was bad and try to improve with that. So that's where these learnings actually came from mainly. Okay, and now that I've talked so much about the past and about old projects, I actually want to, um, yeah, make, make a bit of advertisement. I see you if you may like to get involved with us. So right now, if there are any students in the audience, maybe that's interesting for you because right now we're actually in the phase of looking for students who want to participate in our first industry phase. So. We are almost finished with um, finalizing projects with partner companies, and we're now looking for students who actually want to participate. And I mean, I already talked about what it's basically about. So you will work with a group of three, four, five students on a project at a partner company and work on implementing some AI framework and be relatively independent and really work in your team. And these are some partners we've already confirmed for this phase. I think it's a pretty nice selection. And we also started this time to include uh, non-profit organizations like Convention Labs, which is a healthcare project we will be doing. And yeah, the kickoff will be 15th of September. Uh, there will also be conversations. So if you're interested, just scan a QR code, feel free to apply um, or send us a text afterwards. It's also fine. And then next to the industry phase 3.0, we of course 
also always interested in connecting to new companies. So if there's any one of you in the audience who's maybe working at a company, at a startup, a small estate company, and you're interested in doing a project with us, I think I've lined out most of the benefits to so really think we have a pool of motivated, talented people we can connect you with. And we can also really create good insights by having new views on the problem of people coming into a subject and really working on a new approach, maybe that the company has worked on before so much. And yeah, if that sounds interesting to you. This is just a general outline. So you really have it down in numbers. So it's basically 10 week time frame, four to five students working 15 hours per week. Like that's how it's set out. And in the end, we provide sourcing for the applicants. We help you with defining it the problem or the project and we also do some marketing around our event on our various social channels so yeah if that sounds interesting to you uh the industry phase 4.0 is just around the corner we will actively start sourcing in october but of course we're always interested in getting in contact so feel free to reach out and that was actually already it from us um we thank you for your attention uh we're now open to questions if there are any uh yeah thank you feel free to connect of course also with us on linkedin thank you very much feel free everyone leaving your linkedin profile and information for a later connection through my road there is a question in the chat from sharwari she's asking uh from about the criteria or requirements to join the team um the team for the industry projects specifically or for totally probably, AI? Yeah. probably yeah. um it depends a bit um on on the specific project like there are different like yeah it depends what what the what the problem is we're working on like what specific area i mean it is good generally to have some practical experience and of course also have had some some coursework in the area um but we also had some people who were fairly new and when you're motivated and going for it you can i think also uh, contribute a lot but it depends a lot on on the specific project Jack, yeah we... do you like to unmute and explain a bit i i also see your phone up. can you check oh yeah <clears throat> yes hi hi uh, yeah, also the message Wang said about uh, some errors happening, we're working on it, it will probably be fixed. Maybe you can try again, maybe on Monday, then it should probably be 100% done. Sorry for inconveniences. Yeah. Okay, what did you want to ask? Yes, so uh, basically I'm a dentist and a forensic odontologist and uh, <clears throat> I have been uh, working on implementing, as in I'm trying to implement AI into clinical dentistry or forensic dentistry. So actually, um, so I wanted to learn more about how do you actually implement AI or the technology into industrial part. So that is the reason I joined this webinar to know whether you have or whether you have worked on any uh, healthcare projects or planning to work on any healthcare projects. Because since I don't have background of AI, uh, in, <laughs> so that is the reason I wanted to connect with you guys. Okay. Um, sure, so um, me, me specifically, I have not done projects in that area, but we definitely did some in, in the industry project. So. In dental uh, healthcare, not so much, but uh, in the general healthcare area, definitely. I think it's a big field in their eyes. For example, last last year we had two projects. So last industry phase one with the MR uh, with the yeah clinical rechte uh, ISA about um, image analysis of MRI pictures. Uh, I think for cancer detection and. Then we also had a project with a startup company, I think it's called Levy, and they were working on detecting uh, or monitoring kids' health with like a bracelet, and they were basically doing data analysis with the AI. Uh, I think it was a pretty cool project, uh, both of those. Uh, so yeah, we definitely have some. And the thing with working on with Tom Venture Labs this time is also 
about healthcare. It's with HIP Healthcare Innovation Program, but I'm not entirely sure what the project will be right now. The technologies used are basically state-of-the-art uh, machine learning, AI, deep learning uh, frameworks. So if you want to learn about that stuff, um, any, any machine learning course uh, could probably help you. I think what you learn quickly is if you work with uh, an AI approach, it's not always about uh, what the task actually is. It's more about the data. So the techniques you use for image data for images from the health sector, the, the frameworks will be very similar to the things you would do if it's image data from uh, something completely else like logistics or um, any anything basically. So it's more about the data. And if you're dealing with image, image data, maybe learn a bit about um, computer vision models, so CNNs, uh, um, things like that. Um, I think the difference between healthcare and non-healthcare will not be as large.